The Gospel is the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1 at verse 14 and following. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable. Or in the name of Christ Jesus, become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. It is the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the rule of God that Jesus comes and proclaims. This is the general purpose of Jesus' life here on earth the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom of God. I used good news rather than the word gospel because gospel has a connotation of being some kind of specific to the church language. And it's just good news. It's just good news that God's rule is is breaking in and it's about the kingdom of God. So what is, in fact, the kingdom of God? Well, it's where God is fully king. Anywhere God is fully king, that is the kingdom of God. We've bought into this platonic idea that uh, uh, we're supposed to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, and then when we die, we go to heaven, and we have that as a transaction. And he doesn't ever say, accept me. He says, what? Follow. Follow me. And, and it's not a one-time transaction. It is an ongoing process where we are in the footsteps of Jesus. When uh, Simon Peter tells him, no, you're not going to the cross, Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. He doesn't say, go away, you little devil. He's telling him that Satan, by the way, is a term that means adversary. And it was originally a legal term, lawyer jokes aside. But Satan, you know, is, is an adversary, and he's saying, get back in line right behind me, where you belong, because right now you're opposing me. And so the primary purpose of Jesus in this world is to proclaim the kingdom of God, that where God is fully king. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? You remember the the first command in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, let there be, let there be light. The Spirit of God has hovered upon the waters of chaos, and then God gives that creative command, let there be light. Now notice that's verse 3, the sun, the moon are not created till verse 16, what, what is the light? It's the same light that in Revelation 21 we have. It is the presence of God. It's the light that God gives. God is the illumination. And, and God never calls the darkness good. He separates it from the light. But even in the darkness, He creates stars to to punch through holes to remind us that God's kingdom, God's presence, is in fact breaking in, in us and around us, and hopefully through us. The kingdom. And it starts with God creating from darkness light. You remember Moses on the Mount of Sinai gets in the presence of God, and what does he do? He glows. When they, when, when they see Moses come down from the mount, what do the Israelites do? They, they, they get scared, and he has to cover his face because they're scared of the glowing. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, gets in the presence of the Father. And what happens? Jesus glows. Brighter than any soap 
on earth could make his clothing. He glows from the inside out. It's the presence of God. It's, it's that which God is. And it illuminates and it breaks in. All these Zoom calls we've been doing back some time back, I uh, was positioning lamps so that I could be seen in the Zoom call, and, and I evidently positioned one wrong because somebody was com- complaining that it looked like I, I had a halo. And, and I said, that's just the glory. I, I wish it were that easy. We're to be in the, in the light of God until the light of God is fully in us. You remember John chapter 3, there, there is the story of Nick come at night. Nicodemus comes by night. But what does Jesus say after he gives us that famous 16th verse, for God so loved the world? He talks about light and he talks about darkness. And he tells us that, uh, uh, let me find the text here real quickly and, and I'll share it with you. And this is the condem- condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be seen clearly that they are done in God. And so we have this presence of God From Revelation 21 at verse 22, we hear there's no temple in the New Jerusalem. By the way, church doesn't make it to heaven. There there is no temple in, in the New Jerusalem. But verse 23, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. That is the ending story. We had in creation... God spoke and there was light. And in the new creation, Revelation 21 at verse 23, the light shines again. And there was no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who saved it shall walk in the light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. It's Gates shall not be shut by day, and there wasn't any more light, any more night. Now in Genesis 1, night is allowed, but as the story closes out, Revelation 21, there is no more night. Darkness is gone. So what does it mean? To live in God's kingdom, it means to live in the light of God until God's light lives in us. And again, Jesus never said, accept me. He said, follow me. Now, after John was put in prison, just in case you forgot how the gospel of Mark opens, there's no birth narrative We just jump straight in. And we have Jesus baptized. And we have Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we have Jesus claimed by the Father. And then 40 days in the wilderness tempted. You see, Jesus learned by doing... And you're going to see in a minute, that's his approach for you and for me. Y'all know how I learned to do ministry? First month I was in seminary, they took me to a hospital downtown Atlanta and gave me a badge that said Chaplain Earl Dickerson and said, pin this on and go up to 4 East. That's your floor. No classes. Didn't even know I was saved. Just sent me out on the floor. First room I visited. Knocked on the door, entered, said, excuse me, I'm 
Chaplain Dickerson. I came and she said, oh, I am so glad to see you, Chaplain. I just died. I don't know how I missed the crash cart leaving because clinically she had just been resuscitated. First, first person I ever visited. First month, second week in seminary. I just died. And I saw the Lord. Except I didn't get to see his face. She said, I, I started looking at his feet. And they were sandaled. And they were dirty from walking the streets. And as I came up and he was wearing a robe and he was glowing. But I came back to life before I saw his face. I don't think I would have left had I seen his face. First, I mean, they just threw me out into doing. Not studying. Now, after John was put in prison, Paul's there. It always struck me that it was like the father said, you're up to Jesus at that point. You know, first there's John and he's preaching repentance. And then John's put into prison and it's like the father says to Jesus, okay, boy, you're up. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God and saying, what were his words? The time is fulfilled. Time there is Kairos, the fullness of time, the appropriate time, the right time. It's not a time that is measurable, but if you get into that time, you know it's that time. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's close by. Repent. Now that's the message of John the baptizer. He preached repentance. And so the first thing out of Jesus' mouth, he picks up the message of John the baptizer, repent. But then Jesus completes it. Repent and believe in the good news. Again, I don't use the word there, gospel, because we've come to understand gospel is a church word. And this is a word to the people in general. It's for all people. But now... Mark's gospel was written in response to Christians in Rome in 60 A.D. You know, in 58 and a half A.D., they write the mother church in Jerusalem, they're killing us here. you got to do something. And so Mark, John Mark, writes out the account that he's been hearing from Simon Peter. And he calls it a gospel in his first verse. He invents that genre. And he calls it the good news and it's sent back, and by 60 A.D., we've got archaeological evidence. It's in Rome. They don't need a new Savior. They just need to be reminded of the Savior they've got. They skip over the birth narrative. No story about the early life of Jesus. They just jump into the doing. Repent and believe. Believe. Not accept, not a transaction where I come down and pray a sinner's prayer, but an ongoing process that I believe to the point that it changes what I do. Repent and believe in this good news. Now that's the general call, and it's for everybody for all time until the kingdom of God is fulfilled and Jesus comes again. But now, then, John Mark wants to explain what that looks like on an individual level. And so, after this general proclamation, John Mark recounts the first four disciples being called. The circle widens. And as he, Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 
Then Jesus said to them, follow me, not accept me, not pray the sinner's prayer, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, for extra credit, what were they doing when he said, I'll make you fishers of men? They were casting the net into the sea. And while they were casting a net into the sea, Jesus called them, follow me, and I'll make you fish for people. When I was a boy, men in the church would wear little golden fish hooks on their lapels of the suits. Back when more than the preacher in the PPR chair wore suits to the church. Those days. Y'all remember those hooks? I never did like those hooks. I mean, I don't like the idea of being hooked. You know, you get, they're, they're netted up. The fish, by the way, are netted up. I mean, the, the scooping up, it just sounds nicer. But he only said that to fishermen while they were fishing. Point is, every time we have a re recording of Jesus calling anybody to belong to the kingdom of God, it's always unique to that person in that situation. I, I mentioned Nick at night earlier, John 3. Nicodemus come by night. You must be born again, born from above. It equally means. He says that once. And yet we've made that the normative sentence for entering the kingdom of God. Are you born again? He says that once to one person, one time, and it's only that person and Jesus who are there. Which means, of course, that Nicodemus had to repeat the story or we would have never had the story. And yet we've made that normative. Or we've told people, be fishers of men. To the woman at the well, John 4. Jesus said, if you knew who it was that asked of you for a drink, you would have offered him living water. To the man born blind, he said, what do you want? I want to see. But later, once he sees, Jesus asks him again, do you want to believe in the Son of Man? Well, well point him out so that I can. It, it, it's me. And the man responds with faith. My point is, every time you and I are called to the kingdom of God, it's unique to us. There's, there's no one size fits all. Y'all remember when clothing used to come, one size fits all? I would have hate to mean, met that person. It, it, it fits nobody well. Jesus always calls us one at a time, uniquely us. Now what can we say about this passage if we can't say everybody's called a fish for people? We can say that wherever you are in your life, whatever you're doing, in that moment, Jesus wants you as best you are able to live into the kingdom of God and do what you do for Jesus. I heard of a, a woman one time who was working as a cashier at Walmart who would introduce herself as an evangelist of the gospel cleverly disguised as a checkout girl. She had a grasp of what Jesus is calling us to do, to live as people of light. That we live fully into the kingdom, whatever you do, however you're doing it, wherever you are. Another mistake that's gotten made into the kingdom theology is this idea that we've got to go. And we quote Matthew 28, Go into all the world. And we make it sound like the command is go. 
No, that's implicit. It's better translated as you go, where you go, whenever you go. What's the command? Make disciples. But you don't stay as a disciple. John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants. A servant doesn't know his master's business. I instead call you friends. Everything daddy taught me, I taught you. Friends, the beloved of God, with light living inside us. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Notice what is not said. What's not said is a statue of limitations. In, in those days, disciples picked their own master. Jesus is the master picking his own disciples. That is unheard of. And usually it's for a, a time period. And Jesus doesn't say, do this until something better comes along. And, 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 and he calls them to leave uh, that, that business. They're middle class. How do we know that? In a few minutes, we're going to read that uh, their fishing partners have servants. Servants. They're leaving the servants. They're getting on the dusty road and getting right in behind Jesus and following. And they're learning by doing. There's no boundary here. You know, later Jesus will say, take up your cross. Get back in line, follow me. There's no explanation of what's going to come. The text continues. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further along, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in their boats mending their nets. And immediately he called them. Why doesn't he say, be fishers of men? Because they're not fishing. They're mending their nets. He calls them. They follow. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat. What was that command that Moses came down out of the mountain, carved in stone by the finger of God, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land. It's the first commandment with promise. And they chunk daddy. I mean, they just leave. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants. These people are not poor. And went after him. However God calls, it's always unique to you. It's always in the situation in which you are in. It's always learning by doing. But it's while living in the light of God, as the light of God becomes living in us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.